Is there a new red neon light? <laughs> no! <laughs> 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 red light yeah. I thought there should be, should be budget cuts. <laughs> 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 Okay, got a single agreement that agenda items 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and 9 are recorded by Hansard. Agreed. 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 Uh, any apologies? Some received from the Vice Chair, any others? No. Draft minutes, pages 5 to 9, members content they are not at regular proceedings. Agreed. Uh, table of requests, uh, pages 12 to 13 for noting. Can I seek agreement with a copy of the draft? Uh, second establishment report, which received initial consideration before summer recess. Uh, is sent to the Audit Office for comment on factual accuracy uh, in advance of the report being formally agreed and published. Agreed? Agreed. Uh, can I also remind members committee staff sent an email with each individual member's attendance figures for 13-14 session. Uh, members who have yet to respond to the committee team uh, should confirm their agreement with the figures uh, by Wednesday the 17th uh, of S September, which is next Wednesday. Uh, moving on then to uh, the briefings of the day, uh, the first briefing by DFP on non-domestic revaluation. Uh, I can refer members to their documents uh, at pages 15 uh, through to 35 uh, of your packs, which include an update on non-domestic revaluation 2015, uh, a response <coughs> uh, by the Department to issues raised during the evidence session with the Oma Chamber of Commerce uh, and correspondence from a member of the public regarding domestic rates. Excuse me. Uh, can I welcome the witnesses to the meeting, uh, Brian McClure uh, and Alan Bronte. It's going to be a long set for you today, Brian. Um, shorter for you, Alan. Uh, Brian, do you want to make some opening comments in regard to this first session on non-domestic revaluation? Then we'll open it to questions. Okay, thank, thank you, Chair. Good morning. Um, I suppose the paper more or less speaks for itself, but I think it's worth saying that the Minister is uh, addressing a conference tomorrow from the, uh, the Institute of Revenues Rating and Valuation, the City Hall, and will be saying something about the revaluation effects. The revaluation effects, at certainly at Northern Ireland level, are, are known, and, and those will be. Uh, uh, th those will be announced tomorrow. So I'm a little bit limited in what I can say. Clearly, the minister uh, wants to take the opportunity to uh, to, to declare what the uh, initial impacts of the revaluation are likely to be. So uh, aside from that, uh, aside from that uh, uh, qualification, I'm more than happy to talk about. Uh, all the policy areas around revaluation and allowance here, I think, to talk a, a bit more about the process and the communication issues which uh, this committee has taken a particular interest in. Okay, uh, just to open up in terms of questions, Brian, uh, paragraphs three and four uh, of your briefing paper uh, it refers to the potential funding shortfall, uh, and obviously, um, there's an issue of much debate across all the departments at the moment. Um, but in terms of the original 2010 budget agreement for land and property services, uh, did it not make provision for the non-domestic revaluation at that time, given that it would have been foreseen? So it would have been within the original budget, as opposed to uh, an added pressure at this point? No, it, 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 no, it wasn't. It was the, 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 the revaluation fell after the provision of the 2010 budget arrangements. and. Uh, uh, so the department have set aside, and we've 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 coped very well through the allocations uh, in year and uh, through the various monitoring rounds. So provision has been made. Really, revaluation in a sense uh, uh, has just, it required additional funding because the staff that are carrying out the revaluation are already in LPS, uh, but the additional funding was in many ways to backfill others to do other work. Uh, to you know, to keep to keep normal work going while the spe more specialist people were doing reval. So we we have we have worked that through over the last uh, couple of years. Um, however, just there is a shortfall, obviously, in in this current year, which we're, which we're working through. In paragraph four, talks about that. Um, you know, we we did receive the additional funding of 1.1 um, against the requirement of 1.7, um, and, and we're working through that at the minute, just as to how that is putting a pressure on it, but. But the, but the revaluation, the work is 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 virtually done now on on, on the reval. Although the, the valuation work is now about checking, uh, you know what what's uh, what is there, and obviously we've work to do through the year as we move towards publication. But uh, that's that's the funding position, chair. Mm -hmm. Just to tease that out a bit, Alan. I mean, why wasn't it in the 2010 
uh, agreement? I mean, was it not something the department viewed as a priority at that time? Was it a case that the minister uh, post-2010 then seen it as a priority that needed to be addressed? I mean, surely there would have been some real foresight in terms of planning? Well, you recall that the, 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 the reval of Northern Ireland was to be in 2010 originally, and we did considerable work. Uh, leading up to 2010, but then the revaluation was postponed and then cancelled. Um, so at that stage, then you know we needed to look ahead. Uh, but I don't, I don't think at that stage uh, the decision would have been taken. Uh, I, I think, it, to be honest, it, it's something that we've coped fine with. Uh, in terms of the funding, I think the difficulty now is just because of the shortfall at this at this stage of the of the of the budget. Yeah, I, I don't think there's any issue here per planning. I think it's an issue of the sequence of decision making from the executive in terms of getting giving, getting the go ahead for the revaluation in 2015, and it fell outside the discussions and settlement of the 2010 budget. If, I, I'm more than happy to write to the Commission with, uh, full, with the full timelines on that, if you'd find yeah. that helpful. But uh, I don't think this, that this is not a project that uh, has, has suddenly popped up that we, we, we haven't planned for. It was simply that uh, back in 2010, when all the budget negotiations were going on, the decision had not been made at that stage to proceed with the 2015 yeah, evaluation. A bit earlier than that. So, in terms of the, the funding moving forward, could you outline what is required? Yeah, it's just nice to start the complete process. It, it, yeah, we're going forward. For the, it, it, we have, uh, and I think the last time I was here, um, I outlined that we did have a business case uh, with the department. I think the permanent secretary was actually following me at that, on that occasion uh, on another matter. Um, so we we have uh, we have been filling some big posts through this current year and, and despite the, the issues of uh, funding this year because we, we, we're prioritising um, we, we have a funding uh, we have a business case for rolling forward uh, from to take us through to the first from the first of April 2015 and forward because we've obviously got a valuation list that uh, we need to uh, deal with the challenges arising from that um, and so we have a business case with the department uh, and they're looking at that in terms of our forward uh, staffing and funding for that, and that's something that's in, in still in discussion and an active discussion with the, with the permanent secretary. Yeah. So the funding has not finally been confirmed, but uh, the issue here is LPS having sufficient resources to deal with the release of individual values in the first week in November. Uh, values are done. That's not the issue. It's being LPS being equipped to handle all the inevitable inquiries that they they, they, they will get. <coughs> and then, secondly, uh, for funding for next year in relation to dealing with all the ratepayer challenges <coughs> that again will inevitably come once the new valuation list I is active and bills have issued. So, what kind of money are we talking? In terms, I mean, is it going to be you foresee a bit in the October monitoring round to meet this pressure? No, I mean it's not. It's 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 something we've put as a one-off uh, business case to the department. But the issue is around affordability. But that is something we're actively in discussion. I mean, I mean we we have to manage the the situation. We've set out there in paragraph five some of the you know the three sort of pressure areas, um, and those are areas that we 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 will. You know, we will need to ensure that when the values go out, as Brian said in November, we're able to deal with the, the first line of inquiries, and it, it will be about inquiries, and it will be about uh, giving people information about the about the, their new values and explaining them. Um, there is no challenge system at that point in time. We would like to satisfy as many customers as possible in terms of, uh, you know, giving them the. Uh, explanation and response, and, and if there is something unusual about the valuation, we'll look at that. And the real issue is around uh, April and April onwards, when there is a formal challenge system. Um, and it's, it's about trying to deal with um, the challenges within a reasonable period of time. Um, you know, the, the less resources that are available to us then the longer the period will be before all those appeals will be dealt with, or the, the fewer of non normal work we can deal with, it, we, it will be a balancing exercise. But that's no different, I suppose, in many ways than we do every day. But the pressures will be more intense come April. Uh, Peter? Yes, thank you, Chair. And I suppose to some extent you've touched on a couple of the aspects. Uh, just pick up first of all, I suppose, on Brian's point at the start, I, I appreciate he said somewhat constrained, uh, given the fact that the Minister is going to be speaking tomorrow in relation to that, but 
from what you're suggesting um, in terms of the global impact of the effect of, of the revaluation, I suppose once we're past that point of tomorrow, do you expect to have that information or at least be able to give that information reasonably soon after that? Yes, we do. And yeah. <clears throat> and all, the, all the Northern Ireland wide analysis is already completed. LPS is a milestone for the, the first week in October to provide the councils with the, the, the councils with both the old council break, uh, breakdown and the new council breakdown. So, uh, I mean, that milestone will be achieved. That's that's not in doubt. So, a lot of the analysis is done. The analysis in Northern Ireland level. The minister will touch upon this tomorrow, and from here on in, we'll be rolling that out. Yeah, I mean, it, and again, it was said in the paper that. Um, uh, that there is modest growth, and that's that's something that we, you know, we've we've analysed, and at a Northern Ireland level, you know, I'm content that that's the big picture. Mm -hmm. And as you you will recall, Brian and I, on quite a number of occasions, talked to to the committee and said that perhaps even there wouldn't be growth at all. Mm -hmm. um, and indeed, we talked about actually that the total value could be less. Now that, in a sense. You know, this committee know well that revaluation is about redistribution and not about the actual level of value. But it's you know it's probably a little bit easier to work uh, with with a little bit of growth there, and that's something that we have seen now. Uh, but when you when you look at it across Northern Ireland uh, and you look at all the various sectors, you know there is there is going to be a considerable amount of redistribution of yeah. the the burden of, of of rates, which is what a revaluation is designed to do. And given that we've been working since two thousand and one, <coughs> that redistribution will be considerable. Well, I, just I was arising that. I mean, first of all, I would, I would say I think I commend. I think it's good that you're having. I think that relatively early engagement with the council <coughs> because I know previously. Um, one of the criticisms of the past has been that, if you like, final information of the information that is there has maybe been got so late in the day mm -hmm. um, that whenever people <coughs> are kind of, sort of trying to set rates, I mean, I suppose at least you're proactively pursuing that. And again, it's, it's good to see with uh, a degree of green shoots within the, the economy that, that it is showing a, a certain level of, of growth, and albeit shouldn't overemphasize that. Uh, just in terms of the communications effort, because I think that's obviously critical. Um, there's a couple of questions just in relation. I mean, how successful do you think you've been? Obviously, the, the key thing in many ways to people is to embed in people the, the idea that this is essentially redistribution rather than wholesale cuts across the board. Because obviously, the concern was that for a lot of people, <coughs> wouldn't necessarily grasp the idea that because, for example, they're paying maybe less rent than they were three or four years ago because of the broader economic situation. Um, and therefore, they feel automatically as a revaluation they'll be a winner, whereas it's actually obviously the distribution between that. Obviously, we're going to be in a situation where the, the, the figures are published in, in November. Mm -hmm. But in terms of pre-preparation for people to say, look, you're you know you're not necessarily going to be a winner. It's going to be potentially as many losers as winners or whatever type of thing. How well do you think that that side of it has been structured so far? In that thing? Well, yeah, I mean, it, we we had a, we had a quite an intensive communications effort around the period when we were looking to uh, the forms of return for people to return the rents of their property. Uh, after that, and after really last, uh, you know, that that period, there really wasn't very much to communicate. And at that stage, it was you know quite a long exercise. Uh, and and to be honest, you know, from a communications position, we purposely went quiet because there was there really wasn't a lot to communicate during during that period. Uh, but, but we're now in that position where we will be considerably ramping up uh, our communication to stakeholders, great pairs, um, and indeed, as, as Brian already said, the minister will, <coughs> in many ways, start that process tomorrow. Um, <coughs> uh, through uh, by the beginning of October, the, those uh, figures will be available to to council and finance officers. Um, I, I will be meeting with council finance officers, and I think in a few weeks' time. Uh, and there will be a number of meetings where I will explain it. So we will be trying to explain it to the finance officers. Through October, I expect to be meeting with um, quite a number of the business groups, uh, for example, NERTA, FSB, uh, uh, various special interest groups, pubs of Ulster, uh, because we met with those groups at the start of the process to explain, Hotel Federation, mm -hmm. any, any group like that, and a number, myself and other staff, will be explaining in advance the, where we see the effects particular to their group or their special specialty. Um, and, and, and I hope that through that period as well, with, with a number of other communications, I would hope that whenever the values come out in November, 
that people have a reasonable understanding of what, what, what those values do mean. Um, and then through November, right up to February, um, there is a period where the values are there, but in a sense with no, uh, with, no the, with the rate and the point unknown and, and with a, a very different position, it will be quite difficult for people to understand their liability. And, and in many ways, it's a good thing that they concentrate on, uh, you know, could I have rented my job for? Ten thousand pounds, which is the assessment, or could, that's what we'll have to try <coughs> to keep minds on, because that at that period it, it is about is the value correct, mm -hmm. um, and, and it's only February when we will you know when the rates are struck against the eleven new councils and the regional rate will people be able to have an understanding of where their liability has shifted? Yeah, just I suppose finally um, again, you're facing obviously a crunch period in uh, well, I suppose in terms of publication, you indicated draft values in November. Uh, and then, obviously, then the issue of when uh, the actual challenges come in on that basis. And I, I'm just wondering to what extent, uh, I suppose, from a resource allocation point of view, in terms of the level of response that you require on those, do you have any degree of um, sense or estimation <coughs> of your estimate of the number of complaints you're likely to get or revaluation that's being sought in terms of from previous experience? <coughs> Or is that something which is simply going to have to be just demand-led and to a certain extent, as you say, depending upon what level of resources and what the level of, of uh, appeals are, uh, just marrying up those two is just really going to be then a question of how quickly or otherwise you can you can do these and that, that sort of, or to what extent can that be in terms of a, a broad ballpark figure be anticipated? In, in terms of a, a business case for resources, I have to make assumptions in relation to what level of challenge we would expect to get in the first year, and also putting in there some expectations of how quickly we could be seen to deal with them. Um, uh, it's not a figure that you know, there are various scenarios within a business case, and not sort of figures that I would want to be public with at this stage. I understand that. But, but yes, those assumptions are made. But it, without giving anything away, I would assume that the level of appeals will be much greater than 1997 and 2003. So those are assumptions that we've made. There's also the assumption would be that you know it, it could take it could take upwards of two years to make you know to, to clear the bulk of those challenges, um, and that would not be unreasonable in terms of other similar authorities and uh, assessment authorities in the world. Um, I mean, everyone would expect and hope that you can do things very quickly, but in a, in a position where you do a revaluation, you have 70 odd thousand cases, you cannot expect to do them all in three months. But you say, I mean, if, if you take, for example, on that basis of, we think that says a ballpark of 70,000, for example, on that, on that basis, uh, how do you say on prioritisation of those if, you, if you're talking about that some presumably you're, you want to be working on as quickly as possible? But to get through every one of them may take a two-year period on that basis. Because I can, I can sense if you're there as a business and essentially you end up being at the tail end of the queue, there's going to be a lot of frustration at that. And I think people are seeing that. Uh, well, <coughs> I think concerns may well be raised in terms of the length of time of that. Yeah, but yeah, true. If, if they don't see a rationale as to why certain things are getting done quicker than others type of thing, I mean, what's, have, you, have you worked out a sort of a... A general rationale as to how you prioritise, or is it simply a question of whoever complains first will be first in the queue, type of thing, yeah. and, and or what way? Well, you, you'll, you will be aware that there's a you know, various stages and levels of challenge, um, uh -huh. and what we will we certainly be trying to do is is, is is stand back and look at all the appeals and where, where they are, what type of properties they're against, you know, and, and so for example, if you have a, a challenge in a, in a in a prominent shopping centre. You will, you will want to try to get one of those agreed or, or else to court and, and a decision made, because that will then affect all, the rest of, all of the other challenges in that shopping centre. Yeah. So you would, would certainly stand back and look at some of the key <coughs> challenges and to see where um, where, where that uh, a challenge would be repercussive, would be relevant to many other appeals. Um, and so we will, we will certainly have a look at that and, and, and uh, sort of look at the key properties and looking at key locations. Uh, certainly if there's a hardship situation, then that's something that we've always tried to deal with and when we're aware of. So there will be uh, looking at, at what are the key properties to deal with that would we then tackle other issues and deal with other appeals. Um, and, but it, it, is, it is, to be honest, at this stage, difficult to know until we know how many properties that we'll get. It, it, 
Providing the, the list in November and providing as much explanation and help as we can between November and the end of March, I think is always by experience the way of actually avoiding appeals that don't need to happen. Um, but to try and explain the situation as best we can. Can I just pick up a couple of points that you mentioned earlier? One was about the, the, the potential growth in the list, that is, the value in this new list being slightly higher than the old list as being a, a sign of green shoots. That, that's not really the case. The, 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 because the valuation date is April 13, that's the economic circumstances that are yep. taken into account. <coughs> so, therefore, the growth has been because of the passage of time from the last valuation date of the current list, which is 2001. So, it's what's happened over the last 12 so the fact, years. I suppose the fact that over the last 10, 18 months, roughly speaking, we've had a fairly good yeah, economic so, circumstances so, really yeah, aren't yeah. That's, aren't that's not good. a factor. So, yep. just to make I mean, like, clearly, if over the last 12 years, Commercial fortunes have been up and down significantly, and, and the revaluation is a snapshot of a particular period of time. So it's the it's the 12 years that have caused the slight growth, not not the it's not a green shoot effect. Um, uh, so that wouldn't be a conclusion you could draw from that. The other issue is to do with councils. Alan has described a process, and that we're trying to provide councils with the earliest information possible, um, and that is the case. We are not complacent about this. This is very, very difficult stuff for the councils because they have been used over the last 12 years to a relatively stable tax base, and now, now we're shaking it up again. And this goes back to the point we were talking about in more challenges than perhaps ever before. So the tax base is not going to be as stable as councils have been used to. So there needs to be a lot of good forecasting and good predictive work done by both, well, particularly by councils, but LPS is there to help in, in yeah. that process. But it is difficult, and of course it comes at the same time as RPA, which is a, a, a significant uh, well, added in, in certain regards, I can see certain, at one level, I can see certain advantages to that, because if you're striking a, a rate which yeah. is almost independent of what has happened before, because it's a new that's council, right. yeah. to some extent, yeah. if you're doing yeah. it on a completely different basis, yeah. in one sense, that's almost an easier change to, yeah. to conceptually sort of get around. Than an idea of well, in you know, Ockley District Council, mm -hmm. suddenly because of whatever changes there is, this you know, yeah. large sort of change. But, or whatever. But, but it is quite a challenge for councils to get it right in terms of striking their rates because because of those two changes happening at the one time, okay. and because this tax base is going to be less stable than the tax base they've been used to. Is, uh, it's, it's a point of making. Yeah. I was trying to say Straban Council, but from, <laughs> what heard, from what I heard earlier on, you might, we might, Leave might, might be swearing at you on that basis. We stand on. <laughs> Paul, thank you very much. Uh, just um, appreciate that uh, um, your last comment I see maybe helped to, to deal with that. Uh, we've, we've run into a perverse issue where the people who assessed what rates we as, or what rent we as MLAs should be paying for our premises were sometimes the same people who actually set the rent in the first place and then came back and said that they needed £3,000 a year less after revaluing it through the Assembly. So I'm wondering, because a number of landlords have adjusted the rent of property dramatically, some have adjusted it simply to allow them to save paying rates on the property, is there any way, and they have said that that's simply because certain towns have been affected worse during the, the period of crisis, can and will that be taken into account in some way about your calculation of what the rent will be in those areas, what a reference rent base, base is? But it, yeah, the, the, the basis for the revaluation, and, and which is set in, in, in the rates order, is in statute, is as an assessment of the rental value of the property at the 1st of April 2013. It defines even much more detail than that and uh, what we can take into account. But it is an assessment of the rental value of that property. Now, in, in any parade of three or four shops, it could be identical shops, and the landlord, if the landlord is different, as you have described, there would be the landlord will come at it in a different way, and their own financial situation could mean that one person gives it for a pound, and the other person is getting a, a reasonable level of rent. Uh, and so, in our assessment of those four shops for revaluation, uh, you take into account the market, but you don't. 
you don't necessarily go to a pound no. because that shop is let for a pound and that's a very simplistic answer but we are standing back and saying if this property was vacant and to let what would it be rented for? What would, what's our assessment of rent? So it's a, it's a general market assessment, looking at the street as a whole, the town as a whole, the neighbourhood, and, and uh, that's why we asked people to respond and provide us with the rental information. Some of that rental information could have been four years before 2013, but to be honest, it was good of them to provide it, but it really wasn't relevant, all that relevant to the situation of 2013, because of it was before the recession. We're in a very different ball game, so we're looking for rents that of the deals that were made around the 2013 date, um, and we selected those very carefully. Um, we won't have a rent in every street, uh, but we will have rents that we can uh, look at and using our experience uh, and proof of skill that we can make an assessment of each individual property. Just, just, just on that point, and it's, it's to come back to the, the issue that many of the businesses and the revaluation of the non-domestic were well aware that this process was going on, uh, and appreciate that you have done everything within your power to engage. Has there been the same commitment of engagement with LPS in this process uh, in coming forward with a positive? Uh, well, what I call a full picture of what is actually going on within the home market in Northern Ireland. You, you, as a valuer, you always look for more information if you could get it. Uh, we were reasonably content with the level of response we got. We also engaged, as I said earlier, with the business community, the business sectors, um, and I'm pleased with the level of interaction that we've had. We've also we established also a, a working forum with the Royal Institution of Charter Surveyors. Um, we meet regularly with that forum, and so we, we discuss with the, the major agents in Northern Ireland um, in terms of their interpretation of the market and have kept them informed as we've gone through. Um, I think people generally uh, understand the importance of responding. There will always be those who want to play their cards very close to their chest, um, and, and that will no doubt happen, and they'll pop up with a rent. Uh, at the at the at the after publication, so reasonably content with the level. Um, we do have access to a lot of information, uh, and um, there there will be information, no doubt, that will be surprising to us at some stage. Um, but we'll we'll deal with that as it comes along. Yeah, I mean, e April thirteen, commercial property market was peppered with distressed deals on both sides. You know, some landlords forced to forced to rent for very little money, some tenants unable to pay anything but very little money. So it's a v the most difficult market to read that LPS has ever faced in relation to a revaluation. The other point, uh, decapitalisation um, within um, probably more of our state yeah. from uh, facilities such as schools and uh, hospitals and things like that. Uh, there was a change in relation to how that was being calculated, and there was a policy issue. Yeah. What way had that uh, been? I appreciate we all were supposed to have received some paper on that in yes. July or uh, July yes. time, but it's, there's some reference to how that has been. There's been a change in how there that has been a possible. change. We uh, we had a consultation running from I think it was very early this year. And uh, we wanted to see how the revaluation was panning out before we, the minister made a final decision on that, and we're glad that we did. We took into account a lot of the. We changed our proposals quite significantly, and struck the capitalisation rates 20 per cent lower than we had originally proposed. Our original proposal was to align with the rest of the, or well, certainly with Scotland and England, but we decided to go, <coughs> to go lower than that because the. The cost rent equation, and this is to do with the specialised properties, mostly public sector, but some private sector, such as airports and so on. Uh, mo most of the uh, cost based ones have faced cost inflation over the last 12 years, whereas there's not been the same level of rental growth over that period. So that had to be moderated. And we took account of all the, of all the views to that consultation, and the minister decided to strike them 20% lower. And we, we, we had proposed.
Can I ask? Because of that very effect that you're describing, which is the impact on the public sector. And I want to just I want to just clarify this in my own mind. Is that just an accounting process between departments where we would actually be removing money which would have been used for frontline delivery, but to pay to pay towards LPS? Which is going in one hand but still coming back in the other, if you pick it. Yeah. It's really just a balance. I mean, you'll see from the consultation and way forward report that it, it, it is becoming a, a bit of an issue of circular money. Yeah. And that we, you know, that we, we really needed to ensure that we didn't, we, we didn't cause a, a whole issue over something that is, in, a, in essence, an accounting treatment. Okay, thank you very much. Mitchell? Yep. Um, at what point, at what point in this process will the uh, the old list expire and the new list take effect? It, um, the old list expires on the thirty first of March, uh, twenty fifteen. In terms of uh, so the bills that go out on the first of April, twenty fifteen, will be based on the new values. Um, and so obviously, uh, obviously, there's still a bit of work based on the old values where people have appeals and challenges to work through. But is the standard not just the, the standard financial is just on, year? Yeah, the standard is financial year. So the, the, new, the new bills in April will, will contain a lot of information about the, the revaluation in, the, in the, the, the rates leaf that will be expanded. But yes, the bills that go out in April for the non-domestics will be based on the, on the new values. The domestics will continue on the existing. And uh, in your note, you talk about the uh, the pressures on the departmental baseline and the shortfall in terms of the allocation that you require. Does that indicate that there is uh, some risk of slippage in the November web release? Yeah, that's no, the, definitely going to happen. No, the, the values, uh, Mr. McLaughlin, are, are already completed, um, and we've looked at. There, there is a value against every single property in Northern Ireland, as I sit here now. So we have uh, we have brought that project in more or less on time. Our next milestone, as Brian said earlier, is that all the values are are at eleven council level and twenty six council level. And so this month we're we're just quality assuring. We're going through there are a number of changes we are making, but they won't be material um, in my mind to the whole at Northern Ireland level. Yeah. They would be material any changes we do this month right down at local level. But that's the process that we're moving through, and by the first, by the beginning of October, councils will have that information to start yeah. the iterative and process. And I mean, it VPP. kickstarts a lot of processes, including the individual appeals and disputes, yeah. uh, as well, well as allowing the well, councils no, to start it, their it, process. Well, it does it in, in a way that uh, when when the values go on the web in November, there is no challenge system at that point in time. It's no, but at least it's kind of then people know that they have yeah. to go and get some homework done, get a yeah. case prepared exactly. at the end of the challenge. Yeah. 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 Uh, but as I said earlier, though, it will be more difficult to call it the liability uh, but in this particular circumstances of this year, but until because of, because of the uh, of RPA. I yeah I think it's complicated because of RPA even though it might over you know, a period of time become a much more streamlined process but and, and a more stable process. Uh, the uh, what I'm thinking about is that uh, there is an imponderable in the uh, the extent of challenge this time. I suspect it's going to be uh, quite vigorous yeah. and, and substantially higher than uh, previously. Uh, and you know, the sooner the better. And I think it is important that we can actually state with some confidence that the uh, the web release will go ahead, yeah. uh, because you will immediately start to get uh, queries, even if it's not a formal process yeah. at the stage. But you'll get uh, some gauge of the extent to which people are yeah. disappointed. I think there's there's maybe an unrealistic expectation out there, and I suspect there's going to be a lot of knee jerking initially. Yeah, I agree entirely. Yeah. There, I mean, there is, uh, having said uh, earlier that there's growth in the list. Uh, that's the totality of the list. There, there are prime. You know, without giving figures here, there are pr there are prime shops, pr prime retail areas that will see considerable reduction in in, in their relative value uh, compared to the other areas. And mm. when, but that's that's what the market was telling us, and and that's what it, the business community were telling us, and that's reflected in in the assessments. There, there are other areas where there's still considerable real increase, um, and again, that that will not be any surprise. Uh, but the redistribution that, that the business community um, said was necessary w will be shown. But I, I, I agree with you. There still would be people, and Brian's point earlier, it's relative to 20, 
2001. So there are many other shops where the value has increased since 2001, but the relativity has changed between that shop and perhaps one of the prime shops in Belfast. Yeah, I mean, there are many shops that have increased since 2001, but are a third of the value they were in 2008. Yeah. You know, uh, which leads to the unrealistic expectation, yeah, the no, natural no. expectation, but it's unrealistic in terms of what this revaluation can deliver. Yeah, because people's memories will only go back to the height yeah, point. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I, th I think so, certainly in, in a number of markets, and particularly in retail, there's a flattening out of, of the values, so the, the high values of, in, in particular retail sectors will have uh, you know, been depressed and other ones, so there's a broader, le, you know, less height in the, in the, in the market. Okay, and it's just a detail, I think, to follow up on the point that uh, the Chair was making at the start. Do you see the, uh, the 1.7 resource, but that was, uh, was that the, the, the figure that was submitted at the time of the budget discussion? The, the approach was to deal with it as a 1.1 manager line in the, in the budget with uh, the shortfall made up over a period of time? The, 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 the or has that changed from the budget? Certainly last year, um, we, we set out the, the, the additional cost of reval through, through the, the period of the project. And it, you know, our, our estimate was that it was, would be 1.7 million for this At current. At the time of the budget year. discussion. Not, no, in, in terms of just within the period of the project, within period, within this budget period. Okay, what know. I'm getting is, did it change over the course of the last year? Was it growing, and and it hadn't no. been allocated because it no. hadn't been. It was always going to be dealt with in June monitoring. That's the department had decided that that our additional requirements for this year would be dealt with as a monitor in year monitoring bid. Um, and it was known that it would be of the order of 1.7, you know, fairly early on. There was no provision in our baseline uh, for revaluation. And well, what's the de minimis limit? Could it have been done in one fell swoop? Yeah, you, you mean could the could the funding be made available at the beginning of the project? No, even in the monitoring round, could it have been dealt with within the the de minimis, or had it to be done in a piecemeal incremental basis? But it, I mean, there would have been a number of you know at a departmental level, and I'm not really skilled to deal with that one. Uh, but it, at a, at, from LPS's perspective, you know, 1.7 million was was what we required, and I presume that there are other other bids with, in the department for gene monitoring. And very few of them were met, as, as you will know. Um, and so we were still, we did get 1.1 million in, it, in advance of that formal round. And so there is still a shortfall there. Yeah. But you mean, to answer your question, yes, they, they, there was permitted redeployment of resources from other areas within the department to allow that funding to go to revaluation through the monitoring process. Yeah, what I'm getting at is realistically, June monitoring was your only. Yes, chance because October is already late, yes, and February is far too late yeah. uh, to impact on your project. Yeah. Um, it, it now, was uh, that 0.6 million pound an available option at that stage, or did this problem emerge in the course of the period from the striking of the uh, the budget uh, and June monitoring? No, the, the, well, the point, if I understand, the 0.6 was not a surprise. To, to us nor the department, the, you know, the 1.7 was a no one. The cost of the revaluation um, was was there in a business case at the start. There would have been some adjustments as we as we moved through, um, but our only availability to get that additionality was through monitoring rounds. Okay, uh, and you're looking at other options now, and, and I actually just intend to leave it at that. But I will return to it if we find that. Uh, but in fact, what we hear then is that the uh, the money couldn't be made available. That you need to complete this project. It has been, you know, in, a, in its own way, uh, it's been far too long uh, been addressed. But at least, like you're uh, you're now up to speed, and we intend to ensure this is done now on on a on a, on a standard kind there, of basis going forward. There are pressures yeah. on us, and there are pressures in LPS, as there are pressures in the department, um, and and we have to reprioritise because the. The, the point six can't be something that is committed, um, and it's committed in terms of, of, of services and, and, and resources that we require to deliver. And, and the, as we continue right through to the 1.7, 1.7 1 
was up to the 31st of March next year. But given uh, what is uh, already on the slate, whether it's agreed or not on October monitoring, uh, you must face the prospect that you're not going to get your 0.6. Yeah, well, we, well, we, we, can, can I just say that the unexpected pressure here is a 4.4 per cent cut on DFP across the board, and the outworkings of that have not been settled yet. So that's probably the, the, the unexpected part of the equation. Yeah, so, so the, the money is committed to revaluation, and we will deliver and we'll deliver right through to the end of March. We have to prioritise, as we have to do every year. The pressures are just greater, and you know if you're not doing one thing, you can do something else, but you can't do the other. So, uh, you know, the way, as we said, there is pressure on us in terms of existing work. We're, we're trying to pick that up as quickly as we can, yeah. uh, but. Which picks up on the point you asked about when does the current list expire, because that's quite a significant thing, because if you don't get new properties into the current list, you can't back the well, you can't beyond, back the, yeah, beyond the when the new list yeah. occurs, so I mean, it's a very important so, and, point. And let me acknowledge the work that was done to get it this far, and yeah, I think uh, you have yeah. actually uh, faced into that challenge, particularly when there was such a backlog. Yeah. But you know, the department's undergoing a zero-based review of, of all its priorities at the moment in relation to the, dealing with the four point Four percent cut. So, you know, the LPS is part of that. Okay, thank you. Thank okay. you, Thanks, Chair. My question was actually on the issue that Mitchell has just discussed there, because that, that's a big, big problem I see in the horizon, and I think October monitoring is going to be a bit of a problem anyway. I'll not go over that again. But you just established two, two sort of simple points. First of all, on the growth that you refer to. You're really talking here about widening the base, aren't you? Well, we're talking about the total amount of value in the current list versus the total amount of value in the new list. And uh, the figures that uh, Alan's team have produced uh, indicate that the value is in this new list is going to be a bit larger than the, the current list. And that, that's, that's all that the growth represents. Yeah. But that's, that's a healthy state of affairs. It's, it could be worse, yeah. It, it could be worse. No, if be if worse. the value is lower, you're still raising the same amount of money from everybody. But then you have the political issue of the poundage has to be increased correspondingly. And that's a very difficult message to convey to ratepayers, to non-domestic ratepayers or any ratepayer, to, to tell really them that... Yeah, you know, please, please don't complain about the poundage going up because the values are lower. But people mightn't, people mightn't get that. I don't think uh, that's an easy message to convey. Same level, but getting back to that growth, it's actually uh, widened. The base has widened slightly, but also there's higher value in it. Yeah. In a lot yeah. of cases. Well, it, it hasn't really widened. It's the same amount of property. You know, there's no, there's there's no additional properties or anything. In there's no additional tax base in there. It's the same properties have just been revalued. Yeah, there's significant. There will be there will be significant growth in certain areas, and there there will be significant increases in the value in certain sectors and in certain locations, and there will be significant decrease in the value in certain locations, in certain sectors. Um, as we all know, that it's, it's the deviation of the new the new base level that's important. So, uh, wherever that new level is, there's modest growth to that new level, and it's then whether you're greater than average or less than average against that line. Yeah. Okay, so, yeah. so say for example that the, the, the value of the new list is five percent more on the current list. Well, those that have experienced increases of less than five percent will will see a reduction. And those that have, uh, as, a, as a broad rule, and those who have experienced an increase above five percent will be correspondingly higher. Yeah. So that that's yes, that's, exactly. That's so in, in, in other words, Ed, it's simply if if you, if the shop property that you own has gone up by the average figure of of the growth, the figure that we've been talking about, uh, even though that shop is at ten thousand five hundred rateable values instead of ten thousand. In all other things being equal, it will pay exactly the same amount of money. And so, uh, but then, if the shop that is eleven thousand or twelve thousand, it will pay something more. Um, and so, that's it's very simply that. So, an oversimplification. You mentioned there about having you know a rental value established, you know, as a benchmark really for other areas. Is it in, in fact as simple as that? I mean, if you have, for example, uh, a rate. Um, per square foot, if you like, an old money. Can you simply extrapolate that into any other, say, shop in that particular mall? 
Well, well I, I mean, as in a sense, the role of the valuer, you know, in, in any situation, whatever the valuation is, they, they'll have gone up evidence or comparable properties that they can look at. But they're going to, you're not going to apply the same value throughout a shopping mall if, if it doesn't require that. You know, there will be other units in the shopping centre that are in a better trading position than some others. We, we'll know what the market, how the market has responded. We follow the market. So if the market says that those large units are let at that, we can then look at the smaller unit next door and using the experience of the valuer say, well, that one's letting for the X, but this one actually is not as good a shop. We do look at the, the zone A as we describe it, the first and analyze in, in terms of zone A, the first so many meters back, and that's the way the market will look at it. Whereas if you're looking at a, a supermarket, you look at it and analyze it in a different way. But we follow how the market operates and how the market analyzes. Mm -hmm. But we can then, as valuers, take the evidence from location A and B and type property A and B, and then use that to value property C. So and that, that's the way. Quibble uh, then, doesn't it? Sorry? We've got a quibble. Room. Yeah, I know that's, and that's the way the court will look at it. The last tribunal will hear the final arbiter on on, on, on the valuation matters. Uh, you know, when we do bring a case to there, they they will look at the comparable evidence that we provide and the comparable properties. Um, and they will then assess and look, and as they will receive the information from the appellant's valuer. But that's, the, that's essentially the way that the, that the system works, yeah. Okay, and just uh, any peculiar sections, for example, the license trade, which used to be done on a different basis, didn't it? No, it done in turnover well, or something? One time? In every, every single property in Northern Ireland, we get to a rent. That's the basis. We have, there are All different right. ways of getting to a rent. So, in other words, the way the market looks at the valuation of a pub it is to look at potential turnover of the pub, and it's not the basis of getting to the rent. So we, we might analyse, uh, we might for a quarry, we will look at, at the throughput and the potential throughput of quarrying stone to get to a rent, and in a pub we will look at potentially the turnover and the split between food and drink uh, as an, an off-sales in order to establish what the rent. So we've worked with the pubs of Ulster, we've looked at accounts, we've talked with them in detail, um, and, and in that way we'll assess, the, assess a rateable value. Okay, thanks. Just a, a couple of points that arose from representation to the committee. Um, the Oma Chamber of Commerce were before the committee just before the summer break, uh, and they had called for the, the rating of online retail companies uh, and also for an alternative to the rate and support that is currently offered to charities, which they've seen as an issue for, for many of our town centres. Do the departments have any views on those, or is it something you could you could look at? Um, the online retail one is a very difficult one. Um, under the Northern Ireland Act, we are constrained to, uh, you know, we, we can't replicate taxes that would um, correspond to national taxes like VAT. So uh, it's difficult, and I know a number of people have been looking at this. I know Treasury has been looking at this, and Treasury in London has been looking at this. I'm not sure whether we, as a, a, a regional administration, can do this. Uh, it's a big, big issue. Um, I, I, I know policy officials, certainly in Whitehall and, and perhaps in Scotland, have also been looking at this, but uh, I don't know how you would do it. Uh, I, I don't know how you would be able to successfully impose a tax on online, online retail that, that wouldn't be a, a sales tax. Uh, so um, I don't know whether the representations you've had of any proposals in that regard, because we would certainly look at them, and I would certainly, you know, the, the minister I'm sure would be happy to give a view on it. But uh, we need a bit more detail. I, I don't think it's something that can be readily done, but I'm not dismissing it out of hand. As a department, we're open to ideas from all quarters. They had just suggested they didn't have any detailed. Uh, from memory, they didn't have any detail in terms of how you, yeah. uh, that would shake down. But is there any other examples out there in the States or elsewhere where they've, they've tried to tackle this problem, or is it something that's common? Well, I, I, I know the, uh, the British Retail Consortium did some work on this recently. I can forward that to the committee if mm. you'd find that helpful. Yeah. But I, I, I'm not sure that we... we uh, 
I'm not sure there's a practical way of doing that, but we're not dismissing it. As a department, we're always open to ideas from all quarters, but uh, it strikes me as a very difficult thing to do, and we may not have the legislative competence to do it, because if you did it as a transaction charge, uh, there would be VAT issues associated with it. And has the department looked at any alternatives to the rating support that's currently offered to charities? Um, is this in relation to charitable, just charities generally or charity shops? Charity shops. Charity shops, is it? Um, our system is different from the rest of the UK. We charge rates in proportion to the amount of non-donated goods sold through a shop. And LPS has been engaged recently in a review exercise that's written out to every single charity. In, in Northern Ireland uh, and every single charity shop in Northern Ireland to ask them what their turnover is and, and the proportion of that that relates to non-donated goods. So it's a better policy, I think, than they have in the rest of the UK, where I think it's if it's wholly or mainly donated goods, they will get, they will get their full exemption or they'll get their 80% exemption. That's not the case here. It's a case-by-case -case basis, and maybe Alan's got something to say on that. No, we, no, yes, we're in the, in the midst of that review. We've, we, we looked at all of the exemptions, and then we worked it down to those ones that we hadn't been and reviewed within the last, I can't remember, year, 18 months or something like that. So we, we concentrated our efforts in where we had no previous you know, contact for quite a considerable period of time. And so, we, as Brad said, the major areas probably, interestingly, there are more offices e exempt than there are shops. Um, and, and so that was quite a surprise to me when I looked at the figures. So, but then that's a lot of small charities with small, maybe one-room offices in, in quite a number of maybe multi-occupied buildings. So we've been working through and writing out, as Brian said, every every uh, property that gets that exemption. We've, you know, not not churches at this stage, but but we've we've looked at the sort of charitable shops and offices area and, and, and warehouses perhaps as well. And and we've got responses from quite a few. We're just about to chase up. For other responses and, and some responses we've got that uh, you know tenant has gone away well that's that's excellent because we now can uh, move to change the, the exemption and I'll probably remove the exemption if, uh, if there's been an occupier change um, because it's up to the new occupier if they were a charity to apply for exemption it's 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 pertaining to the individual charity and not to the property yeah. so that review is ongoing um, and I'm pleased to say the progress has been made in that area yeah. But in terms of future policy, there, 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 oh, we could devote, I'm sure, a whole morning to this, because it is a huge issue. There's, on the one hand, you've got charity shops and the issue of unfair competitive advantage with adjoining traders, uh, commercial traders. And then, on the other hand, you've got the issue of charities moving into large retail units in city centres and town centres and occupying them as, a, as an avoidance measure. Mm -hmm. to avoid playing, paying the empty property rates, and that's, that's another huge issue. I know that the Welsh have been looking at this uh, in relation to maybe capping the amount of charitable relief charity shops and town centres can get, so that you don't get charities moving into large retail units simply as a ruse to prevent uh, or to save the landlord having to pay empty property rates. But. Um, it's, it's not something that we have on our radar t to deal with at the moment. Uh, we do get a fair amount of correspondence on it, I think. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure it's something that the Minister has any great enthusiasm for in terms of trying to do something radical in relation to charity shops. But uh, we'd be interested if you could send us any proposals that people have in relation to that again. <clears throat> We're open to ideas from all quarters, so uh, if there are positive uh, policies that we can consider, we're more than happy to do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving on to the next session, then, members. Uh, Alan, thanks very much uh, for your contribution uh, in regard to that. Uh, this is in regard to the Small Business Rate Relief Scheme. Uh, the documents are at uh, paragraphs 10 to 13 and 18 to 22 of the AP's Composite Brief Paper, pages 17 to 19. The policy evaluation 
uh, on SPRR in pages 38 to 45 of your packs, uh, and DAP response to the committee requests more information on the reasons why the overall number of businesses is available and small business rate relief has declined. That's at pages 46 uh, to 47. So, Andrew, you're very welcome uh, to the committee uh, as well. Do you want to give us a wee briefing of where things are at in terms of the review and where things are going? Okay, well, uh, as the committee know, uh, the department has engaged the Northern Ireland Centre for Economic Policy at the University of Ulster. Uh, their team, headed by Professor Neil, Neil Gibson, to undertake a full policy evaluation of uh, small business rate relief uh, in relation to its effectiveness, value for money, and relevance moving forward. Uh, there are various strands to that evaluation, and that evaluation is still not complete, but we, we do expect to get the report uh, by the 20, 23rd, I think, of this month uh, f f from uh, NICEP. But we have, uh, NICEP and, and ourselves, have engaged <coughs> in a public consultation. Uh, there's also been a business survey, and uh, there's been considerable research and analysis undertaken by NICEP and uh, informed by the uh, findings of that evaluation, uh, the, the department will be uh, putting forward recommendations to the minister, who will then, in course, put uh, in due course, put recommendations to the executive. Um, in terms of giving you a flavour of the consultation responses, I've, I've sent you the consultation report. Uh, the committee got an advanced copy of that before its publication, I think, earlier this week. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, what I would say in relation to that consultation, it was a pretty. We were disappointed with the numbers who responded to this. Uh, maybe that's an indication of contentment with the existing scheme. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe we should have suggested we were going to take it away. Um, I don't know, but the numbers were very low. How many in total? It's certainly in single figures. Yeah, I think it was 12. Which, oh, sorry, no, not, uh, there, there, were, there were 12, <coughs> 12 responses in total, which I, I think is astounding, uh, g given the importance that uh, many businesses uh, attached to small business rate relief. Uh, I, I think a, f a few points worth making in terms of what people have been saying. Uh, as a scheme, the existing scheme reaches a lot of businesses across uh, Northern Ireland. Um, the economic conditions that businesses have had to work through during the downturn, this has been a very welcome uh, intervention by, uh, by the Executive and Assembly. Uh, however, there's also a recognition that conditions are, are starting to move on uh, and that uh, the scheme is a fairly crude one, but the good thing about it is it's very easy to administer. So a lot of responses to the consultation were, was, we, we like the automatic nature of this. We like the fact that we don't have to apply for it. So uh, some very positive messages in relation to uh, to, to, to uh, the effectiveness of the, the, the scheme administration. Uh, there are also people say it's a, a lot of people are saying, well, it's, we're not quite sure what it does, but we think it would be unhelpful to remove it unless a better use of the money could be identified in relation to helping small businesses. Um, uh, there was a certain amount of naivety about who should pay for it, I think. Uh, there was a disappointment. Uh, certainly, NICEP, I think, were disappointed with the, with some of the uh, suggestions that were made for 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 paying for it. I think uh, almost universally, businesses said, "Well, we think it should come out of public expenditure," and it does have a. a the current scheme does have a hefty price tag of 18 million pounds a year. The other couple of points on it were the Federation of Small Business. And their response surveyed quite a lot of their members, so their response <coughs> took on board the views of their members as, as, as well. And also, um, except themselves, were undertaking a survey of around 500 businesses. So, yeah. although the consultation response was relatively small, it was quite a pull in terms of amounts of businesses <coughs> that were feeding into the process in some way or other. But, you know, businesses of businesses to run, I mean, we, we don't expect them to have a uh, you know, an, an intricate knowledge of, uh, of rate reliefs, but you know, it, it was interesting from the survey. There was there's one or two people said, you know, not sure what it does, but I like it, and somebody else pays, but we don't know who. 
So it, it is something I think that is appreciated by businesses in relation to cash flow. I think the and we've got to wait the outcome of the research from uh, from NICEP, but I think businesses were struggling to tell us exactly uh, uh, you know, what they used the money for. But it's very helpful in terms. It's very helpful for cash flow in terms of getting getting firms through uh, a downturn over the last few years. Is there any evidence emerging? Um, of the wider impact of this, if there is any wider impact, because you know there is a view out there um, that you know it's just the public purse sticking seven hundred pounds in your pocket essentially. So uh, I think it would be useful to could see evidence that this money is actually going towards reinvestment, is having some sort of economic impact, job creation. And I haven't seen any evidence of that to date. Is there anything? I, I agree uh, entirely, and, and that's what the, the department hopes to get from NICEP. In terms of their research, uh, we, we would hope to get some indication of its effectiveness in relation to changing any sort of behaviour in relation to investment or job creation or whatever. And they did ask that of the businesses as to what what they used the money for. You know, mm -hmm. they have surveyed them on on them. Yeah. And is there any indication of reinvestment or any example? Well, we we haven't we haven't even received the first findings yeah. report yet, but we expect to within the next few days. So I wouldn't want to preempt that, uh, but it is a question that, that, that we'd like answered. Yeah. In terms of the timetable for this, and what's the next steps after the report is published, and when can we expect to see an indication of what direction or what policy direction the minister is going to go? Well, uh, we will be putting, uh, we, we'll be carrying out our own assessment of the recommendations and, and putting a report to, to the minister at some point. And then the minister will be making recommendations to the executive. Uh, I, I'd be interested in the committee's views as to when you would like to get involved in that process. Um, maybe it's a matter of having an evidence session from NICEP. I've already asked them if they'd be prepared to come along to the committee, and of course they'd be delighted to do that. So maybe in a few weeks' time, uh, if the committee would like to take evidence directly from, from Professor Gibson and his team. Mm -hmm. I'd be more than happy to appear yeah. before the committee. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, I'm amazed that the, large, the small number of people who've actually... Yeah, uh, we're engaged, surprised as well. Uh, but uh, maybe it does indicate that they are quite happy. And if they weren't happy with what was there in the past, I think everybody would be hearing about it. Uh, and be saying we're doing absolutely nothing. This assembly does absolutely nothing. This is one of the good project, a good scheme that went forward that were put in place to benefit some of the businesses that were struggling. Now, I appreciate that those that I have spoken to have witnessed to me the fact that had this not been put in place, some of them might not be here today. That has been demonstrated to me through a number of small businesses in the town centre. But where I, where I do have some concern is uh, in relation to the funding of this scheme. Uh, and you mentioned the 18 million. I appreciate that there was about six million of this was raised, raised from the large retailer Eleven, levy, yes. and it's going to be phased out over the next stage, probably. And if that is the case, how do we how do we deal with um, uh, matching up and ensuring that it will go forward? I appreciate that everybody seems to be happy with what's there, mm -hmm. uh, and it's it's how do we fund the. The, the, the continuation, or is there an indication of, of, of anything along that line? Well, um, that's the questions we've asked in this evaluation. How, how should it be paid for? Should it be paid for out of public expenditure? Should, or should it be paid for other ratepayers paying more? Should it be paid for by particular levies? There's the one position that the minister is very clear on, and his predecessor was very clear on, is that the large shops levy will finish on the 31st of March next year. Uh, because there will be a redistribution of, of the rates uh, burden through the revaluation. So the minister has been very clear that that is not, and, and has given a commitment that that will not, that will not continue beyond that. But that's not to rule out other means of raising revenue from others to pay for it. But at the moment, uh, the indications from the public consultation are that there is very little coming out of the public consultation to help us in, in relation to that particular aspect. And uh, in relation to, and it's probably RPA that will be dealing with, with the other aspect, have they the capacity to actually take on a new scheme? 
the well pace, yeah. Well, uh, it depends how complex it is. Well, if, if I think, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to preempt the findings of NICEP. I mean, NICEP will be talking to LPS about the deliverability issues, uh, but uh, if it's a straightforward scheme along the lines of the current scheme. I'm confident that LPS can, can administer that. Well, if it's, a, if it's of any, you know, the, the feedback that we get is very similar to what you've already stated in relation to uh, it's, it's either you qualify or you don't. Uh, yeah. And if your property is valued at that level, that's what you yeah. will gain. And I think that that simplicity is something which a lot of the retailers have, and those yeah. that are in, that will take advantage of that, have uh, said was uh, yeah. straightforward. Well, the but simplicity is that it's automatic, which is yeah. what seems to have come out of the consultation. That, that and that also, certainly the Federation of Small Business are very keen on that. And any change to that would increase a workload. It would. It would significantly increase a workload if you apply other rules to it. Yeah. That then requires an application process and probably requires some information to be provided, and that puts a burden on business to do that. But it also so puts a burden upon LPS then to, to evaluate that. Oh, it absolutely so does, yeah. So there's a resource aspect that yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Which is pertinent to what we were discussing in relation to the pressures on non-domestic revaluers. Yeah. Some, something has to give. Appreciate that. Okay, Leslie. Yeah, Paul's already pinched my question, but there is a <laughs> follow-on uh, to that. Uh, in the consultation, you didn't approach or were approached by the large businesses to give their tuppence worth on their contribution? Well, the British Retail Consortium were invited to uh, well, were invited to participate in the public consultation, but they were also invited to uh, engage in bilateral meetings directly with NICEP at the university. And uh, CBI uh, have also met with them. And so they, they have already engaged with uh, NICEP. And that occurred. I, I spoke to Aidan Connolly at the end of August. Uh, 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 for the end of August, he was actually he phoned me on his mobile phone. He was he was en route to the university and wanted to know exactly where to go. So that that meeting did take place. So the, the views of yeah. the, the, the views of larger business have been represented. Because as part we were of this concerned, process. we took evidence from uh, uh, several of the large ones, yeah. and they did actually warn us that uh, it was affecting their profitability level. Mm -hmm. uh, Making in relation large to large shops levy, yeah. yeah well, like, although I would say that wasn't a matter that was being consulted on because the minister has decided no, as a prerequisite no. to this whole process that uh, a levy would the, the levy would not continue beyond the 31st of March next year. I'm glad to see. I think all those businesses are still in operation too. Yes, and they all pay to their great credit. So. Good. John? Uh, thanks, Chair. Probably, so we know the large levy is definitely going to end on the 31st of March, yes. and the minute um, the, the small business rate relief would end then as well. That's if correct, yeah. If it's not kicked. Or, uh, and you're really waiting on the... I mean, do you see that being phased out over a period of time, or will it just end? In, in yeah. the large shops levy? No, no. Well, the small business rate relief scheme... Uh, we're asking the question whether it should continue beyond the 31st of March, and, and that's at the nub of the whole evaluation. Uh, I, I suspect that there will be some form of scheme beyond that, but uh, I don't want to preempt the, the findings of NICEP. Uh, once we get that, we'll be in a much clearer position because we'll be able to look at the evidence of the effectiveness of the current scheme and, in particular, its relevance, because we're in different times from when that scheme was introduced back in 2009, where we were in the depths of uh, a serious and prolonged downturn. We're now coming out of that, we're asking, is that, the best, is that the best way to support business going forward? So those are all the questions that we're asking NICEF. So I wouldn't want to preempt, but I, 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 would, I would have thought it unlikely that there wasn't some sort of replacement beyond. But but possibly not at 18 million. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I, I, I couldn't tell you that yet. And particularly if you haven't the, if, if we're definitely ending the large scale yeah. levy and that's yeah. been, been set, yeah. you're, you're going to be losing that. Yeah, I mean, another, another interesting aspect to this is the impact of the revaluation. Um, we asked a question in the public consultation uh, for small business rate relief whether people would rather have a more general small business rate relief 
scheme for a period after the revaluation, rather than a transitional relief scheme for the revaluation. And the responses that we did get in that question indicated that people would rather have a more generous relief scheme for a period following the revaluation than a specific transition scheme, which would have to be grafted on top of the rates convergence scheme for RPA, and it would be very, very complex and very difficult for people to understand. So th there, there, there was one finding that has been very useful for us. So, mm -hmm. so I, I don't know whether that's exactly answered well, your question, but I'm, I'm, we're, 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 we're keeping an open mind, and that's what I'm really trying to say. Until we, see, until we see, we see the evidence, the research, yes, or, or the evaluation yeah. that comes back, and, and yes, well, we will, we will very quickly turn that round and, and, and provide recommendations to the minister, and uh, I think. But this committee would benefit us get, getting it directly from NICEP in the, in the coming weeks. Thanks, Chair. Our NICEP looking at the distinct scheme that's in place for post offices, and if they are, are they looking at the change in the role of post offices? Because I'm very conscious, and MLAs from rural areas would be conscious, that the post office is increasingly being seen as a place to do your banking yep. in yeah. the countryside. Well, they're certainly looking at the whole scheme. Uh, I haven't been engaging closely on that particular issue. My, my focus has been on, on the main scheme, but they have been asked and there were questions in the survey in relation to the post office relief. So they, they, are canvas, they have canvas views on the, post, the special post office relief, which is part of that scheme. And certainly as a department, we think that's been quite effective. Now, your, your point is a very valid one, changing role of post offices and is it is it is it still relevant or is it still good enough? Yeah, and and that's uh, hopefully the the NICEP report will will cover that. Yeah. Okay, members, moving on to the next briefing: managing convergence of district rates. So I guess a brief overview, Brian, of where we are with this. Yeah. Um, well, uh, the. Uh, We've had a total of 15 responses to this consultation. The consultation ended in, uh, this, in the 19th of August, and we had a very active consultation period. We had a series of uh, we had a series of meetings, particularly with the local government sector. And it's no surprise that the local government sector were uh, uh, the main respond, uh, respondees to our consultation. But we also got responses from the Fair Rates campaign, and we also got responses, I think, from Northern Ireland Manufacturing, was it? Yeah. So uh, it wasn't simply local government. The purpose of this uh, value, uh, the purpose of this um, consultation, was to decide the distribution of the £30 million uh, that the executive has set aside to fund this issue of district rates convergence. And uh, the message we're getting back from it is that uh, people just wanted the one scheme. They wanted everybody to be the same rules to apply. Those affected most would be would, would get the, the, the most relief and those affected least would get the least relief, but that we should have simply the one scheme of similar duration. Uh, another uh, interesting point from the consultation is that people, people thought that the, um, the duration of the scheme should be at least uh, the length of the term of the new councils, which is four years. So that's another factor we'll take on board. Mm -hmm. Where we are with this at the moment is that we have um, we, we have looked at the consultations, we've undertaken our own analysis, we have recommendations which we're running past land and property services just to check the whole issue of deliverability. And very soon this month we'll be putting recommendations to the Minister. You want to come on, Andrew, do you? Yeah, just on the, when you mentioned about the duration, I mean, I suppose at this stage, we're at the early stage really of getting the, the feedback on it, but whenever you're talking about the duration period and it being uh, potentially at least a longer period on that bit, I mean, was that maybe supposed to say just how uh, optimistic or otherwise people were, people saying that they feel that the 30 million should be spent and then gone beyond that, if you like, in, in for the years, or was it the question of to some extent accepting that? Here's the block, but it should maybe be the jam should be spread a bit, a bit thinner, at least in terms of you know. Spread well, it should be spread to everybody. I think that was a key message we got from the from the consultation. There were certain. I mean, it was it was no surprise. I think that Fermanagh 
uh, wanted a much longer scheme. Uh -huh. And were you getting in terms of responses in terms of the duration side of it? But what I'm saying is in terms of the duration, was that on the basis then of people saying that it should go beyond the 30 million or simply the 30 million should be spent over a longer period? No, I mean, I think the key thing coming was that it would just should just tie in with the first term of the new new councils, so yeah. that it would be. Yeah. But, that but, was but, but the, those expressed was that on the basis the, of the envelope of the thirty million? No, no. no well, well, the, those just, expressed a view for a longer scheme. It was more money. Wanted more money, I think. But uh, you know, a key consideration in all of this is the legislative review period that is in the that was in the local government finance the, act. local government finance act. There was a there was an amendment. Who put a statutory responsibility on the department to do a mid-term review of, of the effectiveness of the scheme, and that we will do. And uh, I think that can be very helpful in dealing with that particular issue as to whether it was whether it's adequate enough, whether it affords enough protection to rate payers, and whether uh, and also to look at the cost. See how much this has cost after two years. And just I mean, in terms of the, the amount of response, I mean, you mentioned, which I suspect in the previous section was maybe an indication that people were broadly speaking happy with what was there yeah. in terms of small business. But yeah. what, what level of responses did you get in terms of the? Well, we, we got we got twelve responses, but they were very 15, detailed. 15, Sorry, 15, fifteen responses, but they were they were for representative group. We were very happy with the degree of engagement. There was a lot of meetings took place. And a lot of discussion, and there was quite an iterative process. A lot of councils and NILGA asked for more information, which we provided. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it wasn't simply a matter of people wrote into us. We we met them, we provided them with more information. We asked them if that was enough. They maybe asked us for more information. So it, it was a very useful and a very positive. I mean, I suppose it, it's good to hear, Brian, because it was maybe one trap that. Uh, that a lot of us will tend to fall into at times as we look at the, the volume of responses yeah. rather than perhaps looking at yeah. the quality of responses and it's good yeah. to see that, that there was a sort of very quality level of engagement. Um, yeah. um, very high quality and, and Nilga also wrote in on behalf of the, the council body as a, as a whole and their response was, was of a very high quality. Yeah. Okay. John. Um, thanks Chair. I mean, I mean the risk conversion could be uh, huge problems. You, you're basically saying an answer to, to Peter that councils wanted this spread evenly, but you probably identified that there's more problems in certain areas. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You yeah. Know, yeah. I mean, or, uh, or, uh, <laughs> you want to want to name any of them, but there's you know in Fermanagh, well, I suppose you did name Fermanagh. Yeah. And, and well, and Castle Ray is another mm -hmm. one, and, and there's there are also pockets around Dungannon. Mm -hmm. So uh, what I meant by that comment is that people wanted the one scheme for everybody. So those that were affected very slightly would get a slight amount of relief. Those affected considerably would get a considerable amount of relief, mm -hmm. but they would apply the same rules. Instead of having a two-tier scheme, instead of having a scheme for, for Castle Ray, a special scheme for Castle Ray and a scheme for Fermanagh, that we should have the one scheme for everybody. So even those that were affected only to a small extent would still get some relief. Are you confident, Brian, that the rules will be, that the rules that you in place are tight enough to say, will they take in things like, say, if you get into asset disposal, you know, new councils are, there's bound to be in some cases, uh, properties that, that they would get rid of, will that be taken into...? No, we don't. It won't. We'll be stripping all of that out in relation to the discounts that will apply. Mm -hmm. So uh, the particular decisions around councils, the particular different starting points, uh, w w will not be taken into account. It'll be the, 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 the pure effect of councils coming together or particular wards coming into larger councils, you know, in, mm -hmm. in Lisburn. That, Purely is set aside for con convergence effects. Sure. What, what we have done I presume, is... Presume on that, I, mean, I presume, just to clarify, I mean, there's not a penny going to any individual council. It's actually a question of... It's going to rate pairs. It's, going to, it's pairs going to be a discount. It's going to be a discount on the bills. And that was a key thing as well. Simplicity was what came out of it, that they wanted to be easily understood by yeah. rate pairs. So it would still be very difficult for councils to, to move or to, to inflate a, a rate when they're, when they're striking them, when the well, new well, councils are striking They're, they're free to strike whatever rate they have. We will set the discount at the start and we'll use that using this year's figures. So we've worked out what councils would have to strike this year. In the current setup and in the eleven council setup, yeah. 
and we are we are working out a discount based on on this year, which is the one stable year we have. It's the one year that we can uh, ignore all of these other things that you've mentioned there, and and that will be established at the outset. And the safeguard in that is the mid-year review that uh, was 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 tabled in the assembly during the passage of the local uh, the local government finance bill. Mm -hmm. And that's the, and then, and that's the approach that we would intend to take. Right, and you're going to be, that will that will happen. So then, there's that absolute safeguard for ratepayers, and that, yeah. that or that no councillor councils are trying to get around the system, sort of. As it yes, were. exactly. So that will allow us to evaluate. I mean, this is something we would we would have done anyway, but it now has the added protection of statute. So whether we like it or not, and we would want to do it. Uh, uh, it, it's, in, it's in the Local Government Finance Bill. Sorry, or actually, finance yeah, Act. I, it is a Local Government Act. <laughs> it is, sorry, it's a Local Government Act. Yeah. I told you the wrong thing. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Chair. Okay, Paul. Thank you. It's just, just on the basis that uh, councils will be receiving their finalisation figures and trying to get that all put together, are we going to meet the window to give them adequate warning of where they exactly are with their finalisation? Because we're aware that many councils are already engaging in their budget process mm -hmm. for 2015-16. And on the basis of that, you know, it's probably vitally important that they get that figure as early in the process yeah. as possible. Yeah. And is that, is that going to meet the October window? Well, yeah, this to my mind is just the issue of non-domestic revaluation and making sure that they get the new tax base figures. The whole issue of RPA, we want councillors just to strike whatever rate they think to meet their expenditure and the department will then intervene at a bill level and give a discount to, to, to edge up those that would otherwise face sudden and excess uh, sudden increases in rate bill is because of the councils coming together. So we would like that to be taken out of the rate striking we don't think councils need to know that uh, in order to strike their rates. But what they do need to know of course is to get an early indication of the out outcome of the revaluation. And as as Alan said, uh, land and property services are on track to provide that information the first week of October. Which is which is earlier than they've ever got it before. Yes, it's like November, even up yeah. to Christmas. <laughs> but uh, I, I, I'm not saying I'm not saying that in any sort of sm smug way, because I do appreciate that uh, councils have a, a very very difficult challenge in relation to striking rates for next year because of because of these issues. Some councils are going to uh, their ratepayers will not get any money to actually help them because those councils have actually acted in what I would call a, a mature approach towards convergence and have used maybe a realisation that they were going to be joining with another council and have been working in harmony to harmonise their rates over a period of time so there's, uh, there's, the differential between them is minimal. And as, as a consequence, there's no need for the intervention. And on the basis of that, is there uh, the monies that have been set aside to deal with convergence? If we find that there are a number of councils of the new councils that are not going to have to have intervention, is there a possibility for those that have such a big difference to extend that programme? Well, I mean, this scheme will help most of those those areas where district rate, there's, there's a big disparity in district rates well, and it will help least those that have come together, whether that's a plan coming together or, you know, that's the way it's just worked out. Um, but the scheme, the scheme will apply proportionately. So those where there's a significant disparity currently in the district rate levels will get the most, will get the most relief. And that's and that's what the consult and that stopped me telling you as a department. That's what the consultation has told us. That's what people want. They want they want a uniform scheme that that applies proportionately to the the amount of disparity that that currently exists. Yeah, but I'm thinking of those wards such as the Castle Ray, which has had a uh, historically low uh, rate. Yeah. Coming into Belfast. Coming into Belfast, which has probably mismanaged its budget to end up with such a high rate. I'll just use that as <laughs> not being scorner, but, but on the basis that they have such a high rate by comparison to a neighbouring or, or, uh, ward that's coming in, 
that ward could get help for a year but f or a couple of years and then following year they're still because they've had that help and, and, uh, well I don't think there's any question there's no question about the, the scheme being as short as two years no, I think it's, 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 it's likely to be more than that uh, I mean I'm, I'm very, I have to be very careful what I appreciate say because the minister has to has to make a decision on this but it's likely that the scheme will be three years plus yeah okay well, that should give enough time to yeah. have adjustments. Okay, members. Moving on to the next briefing then, the rate rebate replacement scheme. Uh, I can refer members to the official report of the last briefing session on the 18th of June, at the ta phase three of your table of papers. Uh, I can also log on Theresa Moy to the table as well. Just, uh, in terms of the rate rebate arrangements, during the last rate session in June, the committee was advised that the department is now looking at longer term rather than interim options for completely redesigning rate rebate, the rate rebate uh, because of the delay in the delivery of universal credit in Britain. Uh, and members were also advised that the analytical services unit in DSD is undertaking some policy analysis on behalf of the Department of Finance and Personnel. Um, in terms of the delay in universal credit in Britain, what will the implications of that be for this if that continues? Well, I, I'll, I'll maybe start with explaining uh, what we did before and why we have uh, why we have moved in this direction. Uh, this committee was heavily involved and was very helpful in the process of identifying an interim solution to modify the existing housing benefit rates scheme so that it could work when universal credit is first introduced. And at that point, we thought universal credit was coming along very quickly. Since then, we have discovered that uh, universal credit is going to be delayed. And this affords us the opportunity to look much longer term and find a, a better solution. That interim solution was always just a modification to help us to buy us time to develop a more sustainable long-term policy. Because of the delay now in that universal credit, we do have this opportunity to move directly to that endpoint. And that is what our analysis has been uh, involved. That's the, the analysis of the analytical services unit and DSD has been undertaking on our behalf. And we're getting pretty close near the end of that process. We have a we're meeting them a couple of times every week. We have a lot of reports coming back. We're trying <coughs> different options. The main options are to try and uh, when, uh, as and when universal credit comes along, that we can get a scheme that uh, maximizes automation for government and for claimants, so that claimants don't have to fill in new forms for, uh, for rate rebate, don't have to provide more information from rate rebate, and it can be a, a, a seamless or as seamless as possible uh, a process for, for, for claimants. And uh, that's where we are at the moment. What we would like to do in the autumn, and by the autumn I mean late October, <coughs> is to um, engage in a public consultation on a new means test, a new long term means test for, for uh, rate rebate. Uh, so uh, I'm more happy to take questions on that. We're still in the policy development phase at the moment. The interim solution that this committee considered before, we've still got that. Should something unexpected happen and universal credit comes in sooner than we expect, and we can still use that as a means of modifying the existing housing benefit scheme so the claimants that would be on universal credit are not disadvantaged. I know the whole process is very, very fluid. Yeah. But is there any sort of time scale coming down in terms of when universal credit? When will when will that, that longer term position in terms of moving? Well our our, our working assumption we don't expect it before two thousand and sixteen. And I would say to be realistic about it, we may be looking beyond that. Uh, there's a lot of things happening nationally that can affect that, uh, in relation to change of government and uh, change of policy. But we have to start this work now, or we won't give land and property services enough time to develop their systems. And they're in the middle; uh, they're, they're about to start a major procurement 
to replace a lot of their systems. So we've got to give them as much notice as possible, and they need at least 28 months. So they have to have some idea of, of longer-term policy direction. So that's why we will be going out to consultation uh, in, in the coming weeks. Uh, at the moment, we're flat out doing the policy analysis work using the policy simulation model that uses the that derives data from the Family Resources Survey. And um, once we get through that, we will have a, a series of options that we'll go out to consult on. Okay. Any idea when you expect the consultation to come back, and how can the committee? Well, it would be it would be a typical 12-week consultation. Uh, we'd be happy to come back to the committee. Uh, in the coming weeks, once we have crystallised a short list of options. Okay, well, okay then. Right. I mean, at the moment, we are doing, we're involved in iterative work with colleagues in DSD. Uh, we're trying out various options. Uh, we're doing, this is pioneering uh, policy development work because there's no other part of the UK is looking ahead to the same extent that we are doing that. All the, all the local authorities in England are, are simply just cutting things. Uh, we are trying, we're trying to find a better way of doing it in terms of the means test. And how intensive is this in terms of resources as well? I mean, well, because, we've got, because you don't well there's a small team in our legal services unit. Uh, there's a small team. We have uh, 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 we, we've, uh, two or three people working at in reading policy division. And Theresa is one of that team. Okay, Theresa, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, well, just the, you were asking earlier about um, what if universal credit doesn't come in. Well, the abolition of housing benefit is part of welfare reforms. So if it doesn't come in uh, and housing benefits is to be changed or rate rebates are to be changed, then they'll need another vehicle to do that. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's very it's. It's early days, but we're we're trying to do a lot of accelerated policy to work. So we'll, we'll have much more to tell you. We're near the end of the policy analysis phase, so in a few weeks' time, we'll have something better to tell you in relation to where we are. At the moment, I can't actually identify a short list of options for you, mm -hmm. but we're getting there. Okay, members, content to move on. Um, the review of rate liability for the landlord sector is the next briefing. Thank you, Theresa. Okay. Um, refer members to the response from the department to issues raised by members of the public regards rate li liability. Pages 53 and 56 uh, of your packs. Yeah. Brian, um, Judith has passed me a, a number of issues to raise in re regard to this. Did I declare an interest in this? Okay. Uh, sorry, Judith has to go to another event, but she's asked to uh, highlight a number of issues. Um, she says in this paper that the paper provided by the department suggests only a discrete number of cases uh, where properties over 150k, uh, a tenant has paid rates to landlord, or the landlord has retained monies, uh, but she's didn't have any li liaise with numerous letting agencies. Uh, the number of cases uh, is quite substantial. Uh, those, thankfully, most landlords do pay this across to LPS. Uh, and if the minister is not willing to move on making landlords liable uh, in all cases, uh, which surely would mean less of an administrative burden for LPS, uh, that there needs to be a move to ensure that agents do not provide tenancy agreements uh, that state uh, X amount uh, per month, uh, inclusive uh, of rates. Do you want to pass any comment in regard to? That view. Well, um, I mean, this is the issue where we've got a little bit of a, a sticking plaster policy approach to at the moment, which is to simplify the current rules. And from next year, we'll be, we'll be taking through uh, the Financial Provisions Bill, our Financial Provisions Act, uh, has allowed us to remove the tenancy stipulation from that. So there's simply now one rule for compulsory uh, landlord liability. If the house is £150,000 assessed value or below, the landlord is liable. If it's above that, the tenant is liable. Uh, we understand the, the, the hard cases that have come out recently. Uh, there are a number of reasons that these have materialised, but uh, 
They're very few in number. We have been liaising with uh, Housing Rights Service and Land and Property Services have been liaising with the Housing Rights Service to uh, ensure that there is no immediate impact on tenants. In effect, what that means is that Land and Property Services are um, cutting, the, cutting the tenant a bit of slack, for want of a better expression. They're, they're uh, not recovering the rates from the tenant to afford uh, immediately to afford the tenant the opportunity to recover the money from the landlord. In relation to the Miss Quinn case, we understand the landlord has now paid the rates. So uh, uh, that particular case, I think, is resolved. But that is not to say that we don't believe that we should have a more radical rethink of the whole issue of landlord liability in Northern Ireland. Uh, but it's quite a significant step to take to make all landlords liable. Rates have developed as a, uh, 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 as a system based on occupancy, and it's a system that has a, an element of, paying, uh, of being a, a charge for, for consumption of services. So moving landlords to food liability does quite change the character mm -hmm. of the rating system. That is not to say that maybe we shouldn't move in that direction. but. It is quite a significant change to make and would require full research and due process. And we're also concerned that we would do something maybe quickly that would uh, act against uh, some, of, some of the provisions in relation to welfare reform. This whole issue of direct payment of benefits and so on to landlords, we need to make sure that we align with whatever policy is adopted there. So. What I'm trying to say is that, yes, we, we believe we need to have a radical look at that, but it is, it is a big reform to, to make that step. And I say that from bitter experience because I have survived a judicial review from the Landlords Association two or three years ago. There were all sorts of arguments that were, were mounted, legal arguments that were mounted in that case that would have to be worked through. So it's very important that the department would be careful in what it does in relation to that. But we, we are more than happy, certainly in the medium term, to have a complete rethink in relation to landlord liability. Yeah. In terms of the new thresholds, how is that being educated and is there a sufficient awareness of that now amongst tenants? Well, the, the, the new thresholds, there's always been a valuation threshold applied ever since, you know, in Belfast, certainly since 1929, there's been a valuation threshold applied for landlord liability. Uh, when the domestic revaluation took place in 2007, they had to change that threshold from, readable, from net annual value to capital value, and that's, that capital value is, has been settled since, since then. So, uh, you know, the issue of awareness, um, I mean, LPS do make this very clear in all their documentation in relation to that. but. Um, I think that's where some of the problems have emerged, in that people aren't aware exactly where this is, and some unscrupulous landlords have maybe taken contributions from tenants to include a rates element, but the landlord actually isn't liable, the tenant is liable in law, and, uh, so that, and, and the tenant has been left high and dry. But as I say, working with the Housing Rights Service and, and Land and Property Services, I think there is a workaround in relation to certainly freezing rates recovery to allow the tenant the opportunity to recover that money. Has there been any increases in terms of the number of cases where tenants who have paid their rates to the landlords are now finding themselves liable? Or has that changed any in the past year? Well, they, they are in very low numbers. We're talking two, or two three, four sort of cases. Yeah, I mean, I, I met with Housing Rights Service along with LPS and it was um, earlier on in the year, and we had asked them to identify the uh, the numbers of cases, or if there was any that were coming to light to them, to, to present them to LPS. Now they did so, and they, they notified us, and it was Brand says it was a very low low number. That's not to say that there's other ones out there that we we don't don't know about. 
but the ones that have come to light in that specific issue where the value is over 150, they've paid their rates to the landlord and but in law they're liable as the occupier, seems to be quite a small discrete discrete category. I mean, you're talking single figures in terms of the ones that have, have come to light so far. To say that's not to say that there's other ones out there that, um, that haven't come to light. Yeah. I mean, it's worth making the point that the reason for the valuation threshold is because those in lower value properties tend to move about a bit, uh, quite a lot, and that does not allow LPS to go through the recovery process in time because uh, it's just an inefficient way of ra raising revenue. Those in higher value properties do tend not to move about, and, and that has always been the case. This is not a new policy of ours. This is a policy that has been in place, to say, certainly in Belfast since 1929, and, and it's still the case that those in lower value properties are those do tend to move about more than the, the general population. Those in higher value properties tend to, to, tend to be more settled, so there are not the same collection difficulties for LPS in the houses above 150,000 rateable value. Uh, and as I, I said before, moving to make all landlords lab, liable is quite a fundamental change in the nature of rates, which are supposed to be a charge for, for local services. They are a tax, but it's also a charge for local services. So there are issues around that. And a lot of those, as I say, I, I, I have met those um, uh, arguments in relation to the judicial review that the department faced about three or four years ago. Okay. Any queries, members? Intent. Yeah, but I mean, I sound like I'm talking around the subject because, uh, as a department, we want to look at this. Something's not quite right in relation to this policy. But it is, it's not something that's, that is easily fixed. But the Minister is certainly keen for us to look, to, ha to have a radical rethink of the whole policy around landlord liability. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Members, can I seek agreement that the DFP correspondence is sent to Ms. Quinn for information? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, moving on to the next briefing, I come to the consultation of decapitalisation <coughs> rates. Yep, this is a this is a revaluation issue, and uh, Mr. Gervin, I actually we discussed it with Mr. Gervin. Uh, so I, I don't know whether there's any other points you'd want to raise. I mean, it, in terms of process, again, like the RPA consultation, the level of engagement was very high in terms of the quality of responses. We we had a very useful process. As a consequence of that, the department radically changed the approach that it, that it had intended to take. So it does prove the value of, of consultation. It's a little bit of a techie it's a little bit of a techie subject area, but actually it does fundamentally affect the distribution of rates at a revaluation. So um, it was important I think that we we went through that whole process, and, and we are reasonably satisfied with the outcome based on the initial results that we were aware of from the revaluation. So, I, th I think it, it it looks like it's going to serve its purpose well. Mm -hmm. In terms of cost implications, then, ben? well, the cost because it's 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 a redistribution. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it doesn't actually add to cost, but it it does. It does moderate the increases for certain ratepayers, most of whom are public sector, but not exclusively public sector. As I mentioned earlier, the airports and certain industrial properties are, are valued on that basis. Okay. Any further points, members? Intent? Okay, gentlemen. Uh, one final question. Um, we did receive correspondence um, from a woman in regard to uh, the valuation of her property being almost twice the value that she paid for it in October 2013. Uh, without wishing to discuss the individual case, which seems to be subject to tribunal, uh, when does the department plan to undertake the next domestic revaluation? Oh gosh, uh, we have no plans within the current mandate to initiate that process. Um, it's not something on our radar, I have to say. It's mm -hmm. something that will have to be done in the medium to long term, mm -hmm. because uh, 
you know, values change. I mean, the interesting thing about the last revaluation, it had a valuation date of January 2005. Yeah. We're almost back to those levels. Well, we're back to those levels now. Yeah. So, um, uh, following the revaluation, there was a, a boom and a bust, and we're kind of back to those general levels. The issue, of course, is whether er, uh, is a differential between areas mm -hmm. uh, as to whether that's creating an unfair burden in some areas compared to other areas and compared to some sectors, apartments versus detached houses and so on. We're not getting any correspondence in relation to that. But interestingly enough, the property market report that Atlanta Property Services produced was set up with that purpose in mind, which was to track the behaviour of the market to see if it got you know, out of line with the current valuation list. So we already have the analysis tool to allow us to look at when we might need a domestic revaluation. So it, we have a lot on our plate at the moment, and it's not on our radar, but it's something that we will have to address in a year or two. I don't know whether the committee has any view on the need for a domestic revaluation, whether you, uh, uh, as individual MLAs within your constituency offices, get many complaints about this. Or from my own perspective, it would be few and far between. But um, if you were to undertake that process, I mean, how, how would that compare compared to the non-domestic one that we were talking about earlier in terms of resource and cost? Oh, the actual yeah. undertaking the revaluation is a colossal task. Yeah. And uh, I think Alan Bronte is the man to answer that question. Um, when were the last? I mean, the last one was the last one was effective from two thousand and seven, April two thousand and seven. When was the last one before that? The last one before that was nineteen seventy six. Okay. Mm -hmm. and is that how long it should be? No. Between no. <laughs> <laughs> council tax. Yeah. I mean, the last council tax one was. Nineteen ninety. 1992 or thereabouts. Yeah. Uh, so, but I, I'm, I'm not saying that as a as, as a benchmark of quality. I think I, I think you need to do these things every, you know, certainly at least every ten years. Okay, members. So soon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Andrew, Brian, thank you both very much. Yeah, thank you. Okay, members, can I seek agreement that we reply to said correspondent regarding the payment of the next domestic valuation, referring to the hands of this session? Agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Okay, I can advise members the next agenda item will be considered in closed session in line with normal convention for considering draft committee reports. Uh, can I advise members they do not need to agree the report uh, today? Uh, but instead we'll have an opportunity to offer comment and a final draft report will be included in packs for formal consideration and agreement at the meeting on the 24th of September. Uh, I can refer members to the draft report at pages 68 to 72. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room